Hey guys, in today's video we'll be talking about the Dubois brothers, also known as the Dubois gang. A French Canadian criminal organization that ruled Montreal from the 1950s to the mid 1980s. It was among the few criminal groups based on family ties. Specifically, it featured nine aggressive brothers known for their ruthlessness right from their teenage years. Nobody was safe. Between 1968 and 1982, the gang murdered over 63 people. According to the reports, 12 of those were under police protection and going to testify against the brothers. It all started with extortion and exploitation of strippers and escorts. Not long after, they dabbled with loan sharking before making a big with drug trafficking. At the peak of their criminal success, the Dubois brothers weakened the Catroni Mafia family and took hold of Montreal's underworld. The Quebec Criminal Commission even trimmed the Dubois brothers, the most important criminal organization in Quebec. In 1986, one informant reported to the police that he handed Raymond Dubois approximately $20,000 to $30,000 in drug profits every single week. To put them into perspective, they had connections with other big time criminal moguls like Frank Dooney Ryan and Yves Bateau. Surprisingly, despite their stretch that spanned decades, the Dubois gang never had any well defined structure besides the nine brothers at the top. They simply hired goons and ruled with fear and intimidation. As you'll soon find out, they never held back and were quick to turn on associates to whom they weren't related by blood. In this video, we'll cover all about the Dubois brothers, their humble beginnings, how they rose to power, and eventually what saw their descent from the throne. The Dubois brothers were all born and raised in St. Henry, a middle class area in Montreal. Their parents were Alice and Napoleon Dubois. Their father was a breadwinner and used to work as a bartender at a local bar. According to the brothers, they had a tough, impoverished childhood. They often had to skip meals and survive on molasses sandwiches. Other kids in school made fun of their dirty worn out clothes. Right from the tender age of 10, most of the kids were working hard jobs to earn a living. Their toughness and close knit nature enabled them to survive the difficult times. Even though the Dubois gang mentions nine criminal brothers, there was another 10th sibling, Roger. He was the youngest and lived a law abiding life. In fact, he earned his living working a government job. The other brothers included Raymond, Jean Guy, Norman, Claude, Reen, Roland, Jean Paul, and twins Maurice and Adrian. Of the nine brothers, four stood out as the central pieces of the Dubois Empire. Raymond, Jean Guy, Claude, and Adrian. Raymond was the oldest of the nine brothers and the natural head of the pack. Tasked with caring for his younger siblings, Raymond was forced to earn a living at the age of 10. Before venturing into crime, he worked several labor jobs including being a delivery man, milkman, and coal hauler. All these built him to be strong and have an intimidating stature that helped pave a career in crime. By the time he was 16 years old, Raymond was involved in all manners of scams and petty crimes across Montreal. Even though he faced countless charges, he had the right connections and got acquitted every time. On one account, after being pulled over for driving through 12 red lights in his limousine, he grabbed the officer's hand and twisted it until it broke. Raymond used his reputation and influence to usher his younger siblings into the underworld. Jean Guy was the second oldest of the brothers. He had a passion for hockey, but his impoverished circumstances meant he couldn't afford the necessary gear. Jean Guy looked up to his older brother, Raymond, and it wasn't long before he taught him how he could make some money. It started with assisting Raymond with his day jobs. Eventually, he slipped into the more profitable criminal lifestyle. Jean Guy was no means a little guy. Like his brother, Raymond, he hauled dozens of 100 pound coal bags. He was strong and energetic. On one occasion, he exchanged fists with Rosaire, the toughest street fighter in their neighborhood. Apparently, Raymond had a fling with the Rosaire's girlfriend. The fighter found out and vowed to get even with Raymond. The threats reached the Dubois brothers and it wasn't long before Raymond, Jean Guy, Claude and Normand went out to confront Rosaire. The fighter wasn't expecting them alone. He had three other fighters with him. Slander's words quickly turned to fists but there were no match for the tough brothers who gave them a ruthless beating. Not long after, a restaurant owner stood up to the siblings after they had refused to pay for their food. Without much of a second thought, they beat the owner and used his knife to carve a cross in his chest. These feats significantly cemented the Dubois brothers' early reputation on the streets. Claude Dubois was the third oldest, and like his older siblings, Montreal's underworld interested him. It was when he became the doorman of the Catroni Mafia family that he made his debut in crime. Adrian Dubois was born in 1947. Even though he was the second youngest, he seemed to have a natural knack for organized crime. 
Unlike his flexing brothers, Adrian was more of a smooth, calculating criminal. He was intelligent, and over the years, he slowly established himself in Montreal's drug network. Behind Claude, Adrian was the second most successful Dubois brother. As the 1960s rolled in and the Dubois brothers matured, the elder siblings knew the proceeds from petty crimes wouldn't sustain their needs. They had to set their eyes on bigger things. Now equipped with their gruesome reputation, they ventured into exploitation and extortion. Raymond, Jean Guy, Claude, and Normand devised a plan targeting club and tavern owners. Their brothers had to convince them that they needed protection. They would start by frequently visiting a nightclub or a bar. At first, they were friendly and tried their best to acquaint themselves with the staff and owner. The brothers would then suggest to the owner that the bar and employees needed protection, and of course, they were willing to offer their services at a cost. Most owners declined, but the Dubois brothers expected that. Their frequent visits would gradually become more violent. The brothers would sometimes send their associates to harass customers, terrorize employees, and vandalize the premises. Each week, their deeds got more horrific, until eventually, they were targeting the owner's life. Charles Houle, the owner of a bar on Notre Dame Street, fell victim to the Dubois brothers. In 1965, he opened up to the police that several years prior, the infamous siblings approached him shortly after opening his new place. Raymond Dubois was straight to the point and demanded the weekly fee in exchange for protection and that the owner be allowed to keep his life. Even as Charles reported to the police, he was still paying the protection fee. According to him, the amount had accumulated to over $50,000. Charles explained that he had no choice but to agree. To confirm Charles' closing statement, a few years later in June 1971, Louis Fournier, the owner of the Jean Lou Carabet, was found dead. According to sources, he had refused the Dubois' demands. Around two years later, in October 1973, the owner of the tavern Montreal had enough and decided to sell his property. After refusing the Dubois brothers, he survived several assassination attempts by the men as siblings. Before calling it quits, he had suffered shootings, knife attacks, and hits by billiard cues and balls. Why not just give the money to the Dubois brothers and get them on their way? Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. After accepting their demands, the brothers would establish themselves on the property. It would start with free services for the gang and its associates. Sooner or later, they would demand the owner employ gang members as staff so they could earn a steady income. In no time, the bar would become the Dubois brothers' base operations for their criminal deals. The owner would become a proxy and not have a say on anything. By the late 1960s, the brothers had more than a dozen bars and nightclubs under their control. Claude Dubois now decided it was time to use their bases to establish a new branch of their criminal organization, loan sharking and permits for pimps and escorts. The 1970s saw the Dubois brothers cement themselves as the most prevalent loan sharks in Montreal. All borrowers had to visit their offices before securing loans. Almost all loans came with 30% interest that had to be paid to the Dubois gang immediately after receiving the funds. Borrowers paid in cash at the location they secured their loans. A former associate of the Dubois brothers explained to the police that the loans targeted taxi drivers and gamblers. If you failed to repay the loan, you'd have to offer your services or risk losing your life. One defaulter claimed that he had lost a bet and owed Adrian Dubois $50. Since he couldn't afford to pay the amount, he was forced to become a drug pusher. He described the brothers as greedy and would keep you in the trade even after repaying the debt. Indeed, the Dubois brothers' exploits of the 50s and 60s had established them as a reputable gang. They expanded their reach into the east and west, frequently clashing with the infamous Catroni Mafia family. However, it was only after getting their hands in the drug business that they emerged as Montreal criminal overlords. According to a 1977 police commissioner report, the brothers lived in luxury. They had everything from townhouses, country houses, and fast, expensive cars. They seem to have it all. Mercier, a Montreal journalist, was surprised how a violent criminal group was allowed to prosper in broad daylight. After trailing some of the brothers' criminal cases, he found out the group had people on the inside of the authorities that forcefully integrated them into the community. Police were bribed into giving them a blind eye and judges threatened to offer them reduced sentences. Corruption was deeply ingrained into the community, and the Dubois brothers had ties with journalists controlling the media. They even influenced politicians and could sway votes to suit their needs. On one account, they even managed to turn their favorite journalist into a lawyer, 
so he could grant them permits to operate their crime-infested bars and nightclubs. Nobody could stop them. In the early 1970s, the Du Bois brothers caught wind of the booming drug trafficking industry. Well-connected gangs could source drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine, LSD, hashish, and marijuana at cheap prices and flip them at huge profit margins. On top of that, the drugs were highly addictive and provided a stable customer base. According to a pusher turned informant, the Dubois brothers would import a pound of marijuana at $30 from Mexico and sell it on the streets for up to $750. The profits they earned were almost unimaginable. Of the nine brothers, Adrian, Claude, and Roland established themselves as the drug masterminds. They used their acquired clubs and bars to aggressively sell drugs on the streets. They even consulted the likes of Frank Dooney Ryan, the leader of the West End gang, who was, at the time, Montreal's drug emperor. In late 1975, the police seized one of the brothers' drug loads, containing over 2 million 10-year pills. The Dubois brothers were so successful in Montreal's drug trafficking scene that they expanded into different continents. They had roots in Pakistan through a corrupt government official that provided an almost endless supply of hashish. However, despite their overwhelming success, the brothers' influence was rarely peaceful. Their aggressive expansion was often met with resistance and hostility. They even clashed with the McSween Gang, a Montreal Irish Canadian criminal organization, and what was later coined the McSween Turf War. But the Dubois brothers and McSweens weren't always on fighting terms. They had more than a decade old relationship that saw the two parties become associates. Apparently, in 1957, one of the Dubois brothers was serving time in a reform school when he met Pierre McSween. The two hit off and would later introduce each other to their respective siblings. As the Dubois brothers specialized in extortion, exploitation, and loan sharking, the McSweens had a knack for truck hijacking. They would then sell off the loot to the Dubois brothers, who in turn provided them with firearms, goons, and getaway cars. Unfortunately for the McSweens, the Dubois gang drastically expanded, and they were also not the kind to hold back when they wanted something. Eventually, the McSweens received word that the Dubois brothers coveted the territory they had controlled for years. The war was cold until it was declared in 1973, when Adrian Dubois murdered Real Lapine, a friend and drug trafficking associate of the McSweens. Reports state that Lapine met Adrian at a bar and refused to sell him drugs. Tensions further increased when Jean Guy, Adrian, and Claude ambushed and murdered Jacques McSween at his home on October 5th, 1974. The Dubois brothers and McSween's fought severally on different fronts. However, none was as gruesome as the Valentine's Eve Massacre. On February 13, 1975, three men armed with semi-automatic rifles walked into a McSween gang hideout. Without saying a word, they brought the country music show to an end when they suddenly opened fire on the crowd. Four people died and several others were severely injured. Unfortunately, three of the four victims had no affiliations with either gang. Pierre McSween had something to say about the incident. He claimed Roger, Claude Dubois, and Claude Lebeau were shooters that day. He also commented that they were not cool killers. Instead of spraying bullets on anything that moves, he insisted they should have quietly walked in and executed their target, Roger, without harming innocent people. Roger was a McSween associate that previously worked for the Dubois brothers. In the end, after both sides losing over a dozen members, the Dubois brothers overpowered the McSweens and claimed their southwestern territory. Claude knew St. Henry Square was a highly profitable drug market, so the Dubois brothers immediately set their eyes on the downtown area. However, another war was soon upon them. At the time, the Devil's Disciples Motorcycle Club controlled the downtown area's drug market. They were a force to be reckoned with and were considered among the most powerful biker gangs in Montreal. This time, Claude Dubois proceeded with caution and hired the Popeyes Motorcycle Club, led by Yves Bateau, to do the heavy lifting. Between 1974 and 1976, the collaboration killed 15 Devil's Disciples and the once powerful motorcycle gang was forced to back down. The Popeyes then managed the downtown drug business on behalf of the Dubois brothers. On November 17, 1975, as the Dubois brothers were preoccupied with the Devil's Disciples, the police secretly launched a task force to topple the organization. The authorities were able to apply pressure on the Dubois brothers. However, it was the people on the inside that brought the criminal organization to its knees. According to the police and media, never before had the underworld's law of silence been broken to such an extent. 
dozens of criminals and past associates became informants and snitched on the Dubois brothers. Of all of them, Donald Lavoie did the most damage. Donald was the brother's most trusted hitman. His work was to dispose of all snitches and anyone those siblings wanted to get rid of. Eventually, Donald had a fallout with his bosses and they put a bounty on his head. After several attempts on his life, he turned himself in for protection and became an informant. He uncovered all the Dubois bases, dealings, and secret operations. In early 1977, Jean Paul Dubois was the first to fall after he was sentenced to one year behind bars for possessing $100,000 worth of stolen jewelry. On top of that, he also faced other charges of perjury and contempt by the police commission. Later that year, Roland and Norman followed their brother to prison after the court found them guilty of assault. At around the same time, Claude and Adrian were convicted of perjury for giving a false testimony to the police commission. With five down and four more to go, the police also closed down on Jean Guy. On April 27, 1977, the jury found him guilty of the second degree murder of Jean Guy Fournier in 1975. Even though he was later acquitted, Jean Guy continued his life of crime until 1992 when he pleaded guilty to drug trafficking charges. Together with eight other associates, the police found them with 100 kilograms of hashish, 400 marijuana plants, and $500,000 in cash. They sentenced him to seven years in prison. Around five years later, on November 12, 1982, it was Claude's turn to face more charges. This time, he was found guilty of the 1973 murder of Catroni's brother-in-law. The judge sentenced Claude Dubois to 25 years in prison. All in all, it was Raymond's death that hit the brothers the hardest. In 1989, the 59-year-old Dubois was found dead in a hotel room. The police believed it was suicide. Raymond's body was lifeless with split wrists and surrounded by pills. Out of the four leaders, Adrian is the only Dubois brother that kept the family's name alive on the streets. After he was acquitted, the trial forced him to lay low and ease his hold of Montreal's drug trafficking scene. Adrian Dubois turned his sights on legitimate works and became a successful businessman that owned nightclubs and buildings. According to police reports, he spent his final days in a luxurious cottage in St. Adele, Montreal, presiding over his real estate firm. He eventually died in 2014 at the age of 68 years old. Even though his family claims natural death, there is a request that redirects all donations to the Canadian Cancer Society. Many believe the Dubois brothers' criminal legacy is a thing of the past. However, a former biker turned police informer most recently mentioned the Dubois mob in his book. While it's unlikely that the legacy survived, we can't rule out the possibility that the Dubois gang is still active on the streets of Montreal. As always, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Also comment down below what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching and have a good one.